Hi there, welcome back. The next topic in the pharmacology schedule of lectures is on the topic area of inflammation. And we've got a kind of couple of lectures to do in this. We're doing the basic overview of inflammation in the first one, and we're following that up with a little bit on the pharmacology of inflammation. Something which we will touch upon in subsequent lectures when we look at in a, in a little bit more depth at non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So, <clears throat> Let's just start off by looking through inflammation. Now, this is just a little revision slide taking you back through some terminology that hopefully you'll already be familiar with. For example, what a pathogen is and what the leukocytes are. Now, the leukocytes are the white blood cells and they're subdivided into that list there. You've got neutrophils, monocytes, basophils and eosinophils, each with a specific role in our immune in immune response to infection, for example. So that's just a little bit of revision of the basic kind of physiology of the white blood cell. This, this image here is meant to illustrate to you what happens when an area of the body becomes inflamed. The most obvious thing there is the redness that you're seeing. And that's probably you know, one of the things that's, that's kind of the, the most obvious outward sign of inflammation. Now, what are those signs of inflammation? The, the key signs of inflammation are sometimes referred to as the, as the cardinal signs, and we'll come on to what they are in a minute. Basically, inflammation is kind of what, well, exactly what it says on the tin. Yeah? It says it's a non-specific response to tissue damage, and it's caused by a pathogen or some form of trauma or a toxin or a foreign protein. You know, a toxin might be something that's injected in a sting, for example, like a bee sting. The first person to describe the phenomenon was, was, the, um, was the clinician Galen in the 4th century. And he identified key specific cardinal signs. He used the terminology down the left, dolor, rubor, calor and tumor, which translate to pain, redness, heat and swelling. Those there being the four cardinal signs of inflammation. <clears throat> Other things that happen in an, when an area or a, of the body or a tissue is inflamed is there can also be a loss of function. So the inflammation can be so bad to actually limit the use. So if there was an inflammation in, say for example, the hand or the fingers, that might actually prevent the fingers being able to be used to actually lift anything or manipulate anything. <clears throat> you're, you're also going to see things like there's going to be dead cells in the area and they have to be removed and then there are also healing processes kicking off and we're going to kind of talk about these as we work through the process of inflammation in some of the diagrams that we're looking at later. So if there is an acute inflammation that means that that's when you get an immediate and very early response to tissue injury. And that injury can be a physical injury, a chemical injury, something microbiological. And the acute inflammation initiates vasodilatation or an opening of the blood vessels, vascular leakage or edema, and then leukocyte emigration, leukocytes moving to the area of where the inflammation is, where the damage has happened, if you like. You can then see, for example, why the area becomes red. Vasodilatation, opening up of the blood vessels, more blood floods into the area, redness. And similarly here, you can see where the swelling comes from. Because if, they, if the cells leak, the, vessel, the, the fluid leaks out, you get extracellular fluid buildup, you get edema, and that's what causes the swelling that we associate as one of the four cardinal signs. So, vasodilatation first of all, that's the redness because of the blood flow, but obviously if you're pushing more blood through an area, there will also be extra additional heat associated with that. So the, 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 the presence of the inflammatory stimulus, whatever that may be, opens up various microvascular beds and you also get an increase in intravascular pressure with the excess blood flowing through the area. The vascular leak, what happens is, there's histamines, bradykinins, leukotrienes, they cause a very brief increased permeability 
of the veins and therefore the fluid leaks out. You've also got the cytokines like TNF-alpha, interleukin-1, and they actually cause structural changes to the cell or cytoskeletal reorganization. And that also promotes fluid shift to cause the, the vascular leak. And so if you've got a very severe injury, you might actually cause, on top of these two things, you might also cause direct endothelial cell damage. So you actually damage the walls of the blood vessel. And that causes more leak through the blood vessel wall. So those are the three things that contribute to the vascular leak that ultimately results in the edema and the swelling. So, three things in the previous slide. Important to note, to, to note that it can be any of those, all of them, or any combination of them that can occur in response to a stimulus. So Nick, Nick and back a slide for a minute. It's not necessarily all three will happen. It can be any combination of one, any combination of two, all three, or any individual one. So, as we said, with those three potential mechanisms, if you want to call them that, contributing to vascular leak, that's what causes the leakage out into extracellular fluid, and therefore the build-up of fluid, the edema, and subsequently the swelling. Now, the other thing we said happens is that you get leukocyte emigration. That's leukocytes leaving the blood vessel, passing through the blood vessel wall, and traveling to the site of the trauma or the injury or the damage, where the source of the inflammation. And in order for that to happen, you need to get three processes actually taking place. You need to get margination and rolling, you need to get adhesion and transmigration, and you need to get chemot sorry, chemotaxis and activation. Yeah. And then the leukocytes can then go through and start to phagocytose whatever it is that's causing the irritation, the inflammation, and degrade it, break it down, and cause the tissue injury which then needs to be repaired. There's a couple of slides here looking at the extravasation and the rolling. And these are, on, these are further YouTube, chip, YouTube clips that you can then um, utilize to get, a, a, I feel like, a, a visual representation of some of the things we're going to talk about. Basically what's happened happens is, this bit here, that, that's the blood vessel wall, that's extracellular, okay, and this is inside the blood vessel. So what's happening is, this is where the um, irritation is, this is where the inflammation is. So the inflammation is, is stimulating the adjacent part of the blood vessel wall. So the white blood cells, if I nip over to this side, the leukocytes are passing along, usually in the middle of the, now it's flowing through the blood vessel with the rest of the fluid, etc. And what happens is because this area of tissue is damaged, it sends a signal up to the blood vessel wall. Once, once that signal hits the blood vessel wall, the white cells, the leukocytes, are attracted down and rather than flowing through the middle of the blood vessel, they start to roll along the endothelial wall. So that's the rolling process. What they then do is, once they've started to roll, you then get a process taking place known as adhesion, where they stop rolling and they stick. Once the leukocytes have stuck to the endothelial cell membrane, they then cross through the membrane by a process known as transmigration. That then takes the white cells from the inside of the blood vessel to the outside. The area that's damaged, that's sending out the stimuli, is also sending out a, process, a chemical signal that causes leukocyte activation. So now we've got the white cell from there out to here. It's then activated 
and you switch on a process known as chemotaxis, which draws the leukocyte towards the site of the inflammation, where you can then get the phagocytosis. So, rolling, adhesion, transmigration, activation, chemotaxis. And this is just showing some white cells sticking onto the blood vessel wall. This is just a photomicrograph just to show you that happening. So you've got, the, it's very hard to see actually, but they're just catching on here, the, the, the leukocytes. So the adhesion, how, okay, the, the endothelial cell has been activated. The endothelial cells in the lining have been activated by a stimulus from the inflamed area. But what actually causes the white cell then to be attracted down, the leukocyte to go from flowing along through the blood vessel to actually coming down and rolling and sticking to the membrane? There are specific receptors that cause this. You've got the selectin, you've got E selectin, P selectin, and L selectin. The E selectin is on the endothelium, the P selectin is on the endothelium and the L-selecting is on the leukocytes. And what happens is, that stimulus that comes from the inflamed tissue to the endothelial cells, they upregulate the receptors. And the upregulation of these receptors is what draws the um, leukocyte in and causes the leukocyte to stick with the adhesion process. There are also other adhesion molecules found on the endothelial cells and on the leukocyte. You've got ICAM1, VCAM1, they're found, they're, they're adhesion molecules that are found on the endothelial cells. And then you've got LFA1, MAC1 and VLA, and they're found on the leukocyte. If you imagine almost that, that they're almost like two bits of, you know, two aspects of a piece of Velcro that are going to stick together. And what happens is the, the LFA and the MAC1, they bind to the ICAM. So these two here bind with that one there. And then the VCAM and the VLA are attracted to each other. And so therefore you've got these molecules that are drawn to each other and that causes the leukocyte to actually stick. So these adhesion molecules, these ones are found in the leukocyte these ones are found in the endothelium. They're attracted to each other and that causes the molecule to stick to the endothelial cell membrane. So again, another little di diagram here just to take you through the process. So there's, the, there's the, uh, the, the cause of the inflammation. That sends out these stimuli which are called chemoattractants. They're chemical attracting agents. They activate the endothelial cells. That draws the leukocyte down. It then starts to roll. Then you bring in your adhesion molecules, that causes it to stick. Once it's stuck, you then get the transmigration, the activation, and the chemotaxis. Chemotaxis, is, you sometimes see the word locomotion, just to show that that means that you're causing the cell to move. And it's moving to the site where the original stimulus is coming from. And if that was a bacteria that was causing an inflammation, the leukocytes would then engulf the bacteria in the process of phagocytosis, break it down, destroy it, and clear it away. So that final process that has to happen is once, once we've gone through the adhesion process, we need to make sure then that we can get the leukocyte that's stuck to the, the endothelial cell wall and get it across the membrane and into the extracellular fluid so that it can then go to the site where the, where the stimulus is coming from. And that process is known as transmigration, crossing, moving across or crossing over the cell membrane. Another, another word that means the same thing is diapodesis. That, the word diapodesis just means transmigration. And that obviously occurs after adhesion. So the rolling leads to adhesion, adhesion makes it stick, and transmigration gets it across from the blood vessel and allows that to move. So whereas the, the, the rolling to adhesion was, was assisted by selectin receptors. This process is mediated by integrin receptors. And you've also got chemotactic factors that are coming from the injured tissue. 
such as interleukin-8 and leukotriene B4, IL-8, LTB4. So you've got receptors that mediate the movement and you've got signals coming from the damaged area, almost like drawing it towards as well to, to promote the process of transmigration. So at the site of injury, we've, got, we've now got the white cells to cross the cell membrane. So within the white cells, we talked about the leukocytes at the beginning, we said there's different types. The first white blood cells to arrive at the site of injury by that process of, of um, you know, the, the chemotractive, the chemotaxis, the movement, the locomotion, are the neutrophils. Yeah. And what they do is, if it's, say it's a bacterial source of inflammation, they will phagocytose a small number of bacteria before they themselves die off. Now that means that you've then got neutrophils that have broken down and degraded the bacteria, some of the bacteria, and they themselves die. You get dead tissue building up, and those dead cells are what cause the, the pus, the purulent aspect of the infection. But as the cells are injured, they're producing what we call leukocytosis promoting factor, and so therefore that causes the neutrophil count in the blood to rise. Leukocytosis promoting factor stimulating the production of more leukocytes, specifically the neutrophils, their levels start to rise. After about 12 hours, the monocytes arrive at the site of injury. They change from monocytes into macrophage, and, also, and they, for, they do further phagocytosis of the bacteria. The bacterial infection then causes the macrophage to release interleukin-1. And interleukin-1 is a pyrogen. So what we've got here is the monocytes become the uh, macrophage. The macrophage start to engulf the bacteria and break it down. But as they're doing that, the bacteria are making the macrophage release interleukin-1. Interleukin-1 is a pyrogen. And that, and that then travels in the blood to the hypothalamus and stimulates the production of prostaglandins, which then elevate the, th the set point for our temperature control. So what happens? Our temperature rises. And that's why we can also experience a fever when there is a bacterial infection causing an inflammation. So that process of switching on the leukocytes is known as activation. And once they're activated, that's when they're, that's when they're mopping up the bacteria, if the bacteria are present. And you get the production of superoxide dismutase, which is an antioxidant. The activated leukocytes produce toxic substances that have bacteriocidal activity. So they are also going to then cause destruction to the bacteria. And also another thing that the macrophages do, as well as going through phagocytosis and engulfing the bacteria, they also produce nitric oxide. And nitric oxide is antimicrobial as well. But, it's a, but nitric oxide is also a smooth muscle relaxant, which induces vasodilatation, causes an influx of blood, and that a reddening of the area. So that's adding to the, the, the sort of redness of the, of the irritated area. Once the inflammation is over, you've got to remove the dead tissue. Like the damaged tissue has got to, be, got to be removed. Now, the damaged tissue is recognized by having a rough surface. And there are specific molecules on the... Um, bacterial cells that are not found in human cells and therefore that, that's what's responsible they're these coated microbes known as opsonins and they're then they're, they're part of this signaling that you, you get damaged tissue here and what happens is you get tissue repair taking place through the process of cell division and so the cell division increases more cells are produced and you get the formation of tissue over dam over the, in the damaged area, and that's what's responsible for new, new, new tissue growth and also scar tissue being present. Up 
other things that can happen with inflammation, other outcomes as over and above what we've already talked about, you can get abscess formation and you can get chronic inflammatory conditions. And if you get a chronic inflammatory condition, you can get significant amounts of tissue damage. So it's not like a bacterial infection that causes an inflammation in the throat or anything like that, or a physical trauma that's caused by some, something being, being bashed that's going to cause a, an acute thing. This is long-lasting chronic inflammation. Examples, something like ulceration, tuberculosis, or if you've been pro sort of prolonged exposure to an irritant such as silica, you know, breathed in. But you've also got chronic inflammation being produced in autoimmune diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis and systemic lupus erythematosus. Now, in these cases, the presence of the inflammation is no longer of any great value. These are chronic conditions. The inflammation is always going to be there as a consequence of that. So that's where the medications come in. Short-term inflammation, you think that's a warning sign. Something's gone wrong. You might try and fix it, but if it's, if it's a bacterial infection, you, know, you think it might just well run its course and be gone. These, though, are persistent. And you can then need to, to administer you know, um, some sort of anti-inflammatory medication. As we mentioned, you're also going to find the fever, particularly because of that interleukin-1 being, being released and acting on the hypothalamus. You can also see, although the other things that you can sometimes see are things like you can get anorexia, you can get skeletal muscle damage or that degradation, lowering of blood pressure, see the active protein level concentrations changing, and you can also get what's obviously and they're understandable because of that stimulation of the leukocytosis promoting factor, you get an elevated white cell count. And that's that elevated white cell count over and above the normal level is often what's seen as the, one of the markers for the, an infection or, a, or a, an immune response being initiated. Other systemic effects from bacterial infection, parasitic infection, viral infection, all of these things can have inflammatory consequences. So, just to finish things off, there's a little summary slide talking about the various things and all the jobs that they do. And I'll just leave that there as a little reminder of the key aspects of what we talked about. There's a couple of slides there looking at the different things and the leukocytosis and the various things that happen and the various chemicals that are involved. So those last couple of slides are just for you to peruse at your own pace, at your own time. And, but the key thing to take home from today is the key steps that take place in the inflammatory response. You get the rolling, you get the adhesion, you get the transmigration, you get the chemotaxis, and then you get the destruction of the agent that's causing the inflammation. Five different steps, all of which are controlled with, by various chemical signals, receptors like selectins and integrins and so on. So that's the key take home message. What are those five main processes in the inflammatory response? Thank you.